What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Jermaine's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. I apologize if I seem under the weather, if I'm tired. I'm still kind of recovering from this this weekend uh, when we hosted the live subscribers only draft weekend in New York City. That was a lot of good times. Thank you to everyone who came out for that one. Y'all know who you are. The vlogs will be up for that uh, probably this weekend, maybe on Saturday. Last week we did a lot of wide receiver action. We broke it down like a shotgun for the pass catchers, baby. Today we're gonna flip the script and talk about running backs. Players to avoid, we went over the rankings by tiers. That's exactly what we're gonna do for the running back position. Today in particular, we are going to talk about the guys to avoid. I know a lot of you guys have probably already drafted and a lot of you guys will be drafting within the next week. So y'all need to know who you should not pick. We're talking about the top running backs to avoid per their ADP. Later in the week, we will also be getting into my top later round picks at the running back and wide receiver position. So ADP of 100 plus. We've got a good week in store for y'all. Thank you for joining me, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening via the podcast. Any little bit helps. So I want to know before we start the video, who are the running backs that you are currently avoiding at their ADP? Drop a comment down below. I love to hear what you guys think. I love to hear your guys' opinions in these matters. While you're down there, there, please hit the thumbs up button subscribe to the channel if you are new I would very much appreciate that and uh, let's just get into the video Okay, running back number one this should come as no surprise if you've been watching my videos over the past couple weeks the rookie Ronald Jones, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, current ADP, 61 overall, running back 26. So he's still flirting with RB2 draft capital. Kind of everything we said was a red flag, right? When I analyze players prior to the preseason, prior to the regular season, I try not to say, this is what's wrong with him, this is why he's going to fail, blah, blah, blah. I try to bring up the question marks and bring up the red flags and maybe why you should be cautious about it. And pretty much everything... I said, or any, everything we've said as a fantasy community about Ronald Jones has kind of come to uh, fruition, right? His question marks include pass blocking, his question marks include what his involvement in the pass catching game would be, and his question marks included the competition with Peyton Barber. A lot of people kind of wanted to wipe those aside and say, eh, they're not really that real, he's fine. However, that's not the case. That's not what we've, what we've seen thus far, and the latter of those question marks the competition with Peyton Barber has obviously been by far and away the biggest problem for Ronald Jones in getting on the field and getting playing time. When you were looking at the preseason game so far, and this is what you look for in preseason, right? You don't look for box score numbers. You don't look at who scored touchdowns. You look at their usage. Who is playing with the starters? What are their snap counts compared to other snap counts? Um, going back to week one, we got a look at what we're going to see going forward. We had Josh McCown play in a total of 14 snaps. Peyton Barber played on 13 of 14 snaps. Ronald Jones was the other back that came in for the one single snap that was not Peyton Barber, got a pass thrown to him, and he dropped the ball, which is one of the big, big concerns that we had with Peyton Barber. He didn't catch a lot of balls when he was in USC. He played in a total of 40 collegiate games at USC. He caught 32 passes. So you're talking about like 0.8 receptions per game at USC. Not saying he's not capable of doing so, but the fact that he was never used tells you something. And one of the uh, coaches in Tampa Bay came out and said there's probably a reason why he was not throwing the ball a lot in college. This also goes back to his running back days. I don't have all the stats coming up, but I remember reading about it. Uh, he was never a pass catcher throughout his entire entire career. Head coach Dirk Cutter came out and he was like, Barber is our starter. You know, if we gave him 20 touches per game right now, we would feel comfortable with that. And that is uh, something... That's something that is encouraging as a barber owner straight from the Hefe's mouth. Now, I've done two redraft leagues up to this point already. I have one next Monday. I'll probably have one another one either that Monday or Tuesday. I'm going to end up with five teams. I've drafted two so far, and there are five players that I own 100% exposure of in both leagues. This is a super flex, so two quarterback league, half PPR. It is Tom Brady and Big Ben. They're my starting quarterbacks in both super flex leagues. Peyton Barber is the running back that I own in both leagues. Keelan Cole is the wide receiver I own in both leagues, and then Jordan Wilkins I also own in both leagues. So those are the five players I've drafted in both of my redraft leagues that I've gone so far because Peyton Barber's ADP is dropping so, so low, and he is the clear-cut starting running back here. you got to break it down a little further, right? You see that Barber has nearly 20 pounds on Ronald Jones. 
from a size perspective, it's it's clear to me who the goal line back is going to be here in Tampa Bay. When we look at the pass catching role, I think Peyton Barber is probably a better pass catcher than Ronald Jones. And the good part about this as a Peyton Barber owner is Charles Sims just went on the IR. He had a serious injury and he will be out. Long time, indefinitely, Charles Sims is gone. So is basically just Peyton Barber and Ronald Jones there. If Ronald Jones is not the pass catcher that we thought, or if he's going to be the pass catcher that we thought he was going to be in that he is not a pass catcher, then Peyton Barber gets an even more, uh, gets more of a pie of this offense, man. And Peyton Barber's upside is getting pretty, pretty big, pretty big, even in an offense uh, that we don't expect to be explosive or put up that many numbers. When Jameis Winston is back, they are going to put numbers up. Might not be a good team overall. The win-loss record might not be there. But the overall statistics when it comes to moving the ball and pushing the ball and sustaining drives will end up being there. Uh, Barber's proved that he was versatile. We've, uh, the Bucks coaching staff has proved that they want to use him. They think he can be a workhorse. We saw it down the stretch last year. Over their last five games, he averaged over 18 touches per game. He caught multiple passes in four of those five games. It's almost impossible to see Jones returning value where he's currently going at RB26 overall. He's really a one-cut guy, right? People loved him coming out of college because he was so explosive. He's one of those guys he got a handoff. If the line opened things up for him, if he had a big hole, he would make a one-cut move and blast through it. And I get that, but it's just not good enough in the NFL to be a one-dimensional back who can't make guys miss, who can't pass block and, and catch passes and stuff. That's a problem behind a, an offensive line that's not very good either. They are Pro Football Focus's 22nd ranked offensive line in 2018. Now they did add Ryan Jensen on their line, which is obviously a big upgrade, but doesn't automatically turn them for, from a bottom team to a top team. If anything, they will be about average there. And you need a guy like Ronald Jones to have a very good line in order to be able to explode through those lines. You know, I'm sure he will get work this year, right? And they want him to be, they want him to be good, right? He was their second round pick. But I think what we're going to see from Jones is he'll get work in between the 20s. They'll put him in for some early down work. Maybe they'll give him a little bit of the pass catching work, but those in between the 20s carries are just, they're not valuable in fantasy whatsoever. If you're not getting most of the pass catching work, if you're not getting goal line work, which I'm assuming Barber is going to get because that's what we've seen so far this preseason, then you're not looking at a guy that you can even consider in a flex role at this point. You look at weeks two and weeks three of preseason, Ronald Jones has not been successful whatsoever. He dropped another pass in week two. Uh, in week three, Peyton Barber ran the entire uh, first series with the starters, went 5 for 34 and scored a touchdown. Looked really, 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 really good. He is clearly their go-to back at this point. Um, Ronald Jones struggled once again. And I think he ended the preseason with 18 rushing yards on 18 carries. One yard per carry. That's what Ronald Jones is at. He did end up adding uh, a 37-yard run and catch in this game. So finally showed a little bit of explosiveness, uh, showed well in the passing game, but he's dropped two of his three targets so far, and he's been absolutely abysmal running the ball compared to Peyton Barber, who's looked really good. So uh, this is this is an easy fade for me at this point, and it should be an easy fade for you. So stay away from Ronald Jones at his current ADP right now. If you want to grab him later in the drafts, maybe like double digit rounds or later with because he's got some upside if he does end up eating into the workload, but I don't think his upside is anywhere near where people might think it is is. So we'll move on to running back number two, and this is another rookie. So a lot of the rookies got a ton of hype this preseason, right? And it's because like the more, every year that passes by, more and more people are involved in fantasy football and there's more people on social media and there's more analysis going on, right? So if you think about it, basically the season ends in fantasy football. And then for like five months, we have nothing to do except talk about the NFL draft. So we talk about the NFL draft and we talk about these rookies and you get to get familiar with all these running backs. So there's a ri that's why like every summer you're going to have analysts that will write hype pieces about all the running backs, all the rookie running backs. And you'll have guys that are like Justin Jackson, Justin Jackson and Naeem Hines and Naeem Hines. And they talk about all these rookie running backs that they love, right? Because there's no repercussion on it. I, I obviously as a fantasy analyst, no one ever goes back and is like, oh, you know what? You got this wrong. Except for y'all, I always go back to my old YouTube videos. Shout out shout out to y'all that talk shit all the time. But that's the problem, is that these rookies get so much hype. Every single one of them has breakout pieces written on them throughout the, throughout the year that the hype becomes so high that if they don't live up to these crazy expectations, their ADP always floats up. As soon as they're drafted, people start falling in love with them. And this is why a lot of them end up falling on this list that I have. So leads me to number two, Rashad Penny, Seattle Seahawks running back. 
currently being picked 67 overall, running back 27. So he is pretty much right behind Ronald Jones being picked. And I would definitely take Rashad Penny over Ronald Jones at this point. I think Rashad Penny is a much better back overall. Um, and I think he has more workhorse upside and more traits that would lead him to be a workhorse here. So Rashad Penny is definitely a guy I'm staying away from at this um, at this ADP. Now, I am a huge fan of Chris Carson. And uh, a lot of the stuff with Ronald Jones is kind of um, indicative of Rashad Penny, right? He has this camp battle with Chris Carson. He is not great at pass blocking. He's behind a bad offensive line. There are a lot of red flags. There are a lot of risks. I've been a huge fan of Chris Carson, and I've been a huge fan of Chris Carson since the preseason. And I was never one that was like irrationally high on Rashad Penny. I know a lot of people absolutely love Rashad Penny. A lot of people still do, and they still think he's going to win this job and kind of run away with it. Um, he was the first round pick of the Seattle Seahawks this year. But this summer has done absolutely nothing to show me that Penny is in for a breakout year or that he's going to eventually run away with the job from Chris Carson. Uh, and his ADP has moved down significant, significantly since the start of the summer. I think he was basically being picked around like 40 to 45, even earlier than that in some drafts when the summer started, when he first got picked. And it's moved back clearly to around pick 67 right now. For me, that's still far too rich for a guy who is second in the, in the pecking order behind just absolutely ratchet offensive line um, and now my problem again isn't necessarily with Penny's talent although it is noteworthy that one he could not beat out Donald Pumphrey he was not the starting running back at San Diego State University he was not the workhorse there until Pumphrey left and then Rashad Penny finally during his senior year was the guy there but Donnell Pumphrey who's probably going to be cut from the Eagles he was the guy that San Diego State used as their workhorse running back Rashad Penny couldn't beat him out number two before getting injured, right, he, he suffered this, this finger injury, which we'll talk about in a second. He did not come close to separating himself from Chris Carson. You would think this first round running back that everyone loves, that's so talented, should be able to beat out the seventh round, or yeah, Chris Carson, I think, was the seventh round pick last year. So he is not good at running away with the competition. You would think that someone who is so hyped up would be a talent in itself to be able to pull that off. That's kind of a red flag to me right there. All summer, Pete Carroll's basically been, been praising Chris Carson. All beat reports have pegged Chris Carson as a starter, saying he's going to be the number one back going into the season, and that held true into the preseason. In their first preseason game, Chris Carson and Rashad Penny split snaps with the first team. Chris Carson got seven with Russell Wilson. Rashad Penny got five, and that should tell you about what the split was going to be going into the season. Uh, Penny ended up breaking his finger uh, in practice a few days later after the first preseason game, so we weren't able to really get a good a vision of what the actual snaps would have been going forward. Who knows if Chris Carson would have got more than Penny the next game or vice versa, uh, but he did break his finger, would require surgery. Now, initial reports gave him a three to four week timetable to return, leaving his week one and even week two status, uh, you know, questionable or in jeopardy, right? He's already returned to practice. He returned to practice about a week later, so I'm not really sure what those reports were. He's back in pads. P Kyle confirmed he has no doubt that Rashad Penny will be good to go for week one and possibly even this last week's preseason game. So week four of preseason, Penny might be on the field. And if he is, I mean, obviously they just need to get him back on the field to get some mojo and give him some um, give him some real time game action before they get onto the field for, for the regular season. But it's never good when, when someone's playing in week four of preseason. Uh, regardless, it's always noticeable, always, always, always noticeable when a rookie misses training camp, he's, miss, he's make it missing <clears throat> hey, practice time, practice reps, he's in a camp battle. It, it's especially, especially, especially important for rookies to be there to try to move up the depth chart or compete with these guys. So when a rookie is in the middle of a running back by committee battle like Penny is with Carson, missing any of this time just sets you back further, man. We have a murky backfield situation between the two of them. And then the big, the big, the big, the big, and then, and this is, this is bigger, no pun intended, than, than I can even emphasize here. I can't understate this. There was a report that surfaced about a week ago, about a week ago, that Rashad Penny just weighed in at Seahawks camp at 236 pounds. 236 pounds, y'all. He weighed in at the combine at 220 pounds. That is a 16 pound difference, people. 16 pounds. It is never, ever, 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 ever good when a running back puts on that much weight. Not when you already have workhorse size, right? Penny was at 220. That is the perfect size for a three down back in the NFL, right? 
You don't even need to be that that weight to be a three down back in the NFL, but 220 is perfect. I almost never, ever, ever like seeing running backs gaining weight. Maybe if he was like 208 and now he's weighing at like 215, 216, I'd be okay with that. Honestly, I still wouldn't even like that. But the fact that he put on 16 pounds is a huge, a huge, a huge difference. Like, is this man too young to remember who Eddie Lacy is? Y'all, Eddie Lacy ate his way out of the league. If Rashad Penny is doing the same thing, this is bad, 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 bad news. Now, normally I take these weight rumors with a grain of salt, but 16 pounds is just too notable to ignore. And when you're in a backfield like Seattle's, where you have a bad offensive line and there will be defenders in the backfield and you need to make guys miss, this is a problem because Penny is a guy who can make guys miss. He's got shake and bake. However, you put these extra pounds on, you're gonna have trouble making that happen. You're not as quick, you're not as explosive. The vision is still there, but you're not gonna be able to get to the hole as quickly as you once would have been. And I see this, if this is true, and I think it is, I don't know why this report would randomly surface at 236, it's too specific not to be true. Um, this is going to be very bad news for Rashad Penny. So I need to see how he looks in week four, but he might be moving all the way down my rankings. So all around, just a very, very, very bad summer for the rookie Rashad Penny. Uh, the whole first round draft capital, I don't want to say it's a myth at this point. I think it will ensure that they at least try to work him into the game and they at least try to make this a battle because like Ronald Jones, they want to see this draft capital be put to good use. So when he is back and he is playing right in the regular season games, I am sure that they will split the work. Penny will need to ball the freak out in order to uh, surpass Chris Carson and ever actually hit that potential of being a workhorse back that a lot of people, a lot of people do. So right now, um, I think he is nothing more than a later round draft pick for me. I'm probably not touching him before like the ninth round, maybe even later than that. You just got so many obstacles in fantasy to get through in order to be successful. We got Chris Carson there. We got being in shape now is number two, a bad offensive line. There are just too many red flags there to invest any kind of noteworthy draft capital with this man, Rashad Penny. So that is running back to avoid number two. Before we get into number three, if you want to check out all of my top busts, my top sleepers, my must draft players, all of my rankings, my top 250 overall positional rankings by tiers, and just a ton of other, my top resources for researching fantasy football, Q and A's answered weekly, everything updated on real time. This is my draft guide that I'm plugging right now. I'm doing a bad job of explaining it. It is an e-magazine completely mobile, on your computer, on your tablet, wherever, wherever you're going, the draft guide is there for you. You can purchase it on my website. As I said, it's interactive. There are videos, there are links to click. It is updated weekly for you. It's got my top busts. So all of these players, but every position, my top players to avoid, top sleepers, all these guys that I think are gonna break out is in the draft guide. So if you have not yet caught the draft guide, I would highly recommend you do so. You'd be supporting me, you'd be supporting yourself because that's all you really need to bring to your draft in order to crush it crush it. So go check out the draft guide. I will link it down below. It is on my website, bigdogsfantasy.com and head over to the shop section. It'll be the first product listed there for all y'all that have bought it so far. Thank y'all for the support. I love you. And let's move on to number three. Running back number three that I am avoiding pretty much at all costs right now is Marlon Mack, Indianapolis Colts. Currently going off the board at 89, running back 31. Now we're moving down the ADPs and I'm still avoiding these guys. He is another player that has suffered an injury. So are you are you kind of seeing a theme here? Guys that are suffering these preseason injuries. He suffered a multi-week injury in mid-August. It's a hamstring injury, most notably. I hate when players suffer hamstring injuries if they are of the mild or worse. Right, if it's very minor, I get a lot of questions about Saquon Barkley, guys. I'm completely fine about Saquon. I think Saquon Barkley is fine. Seen videos of him at practice as early as last week, and he was running full speed. He looked perfectly fine. They're obviously resting him to make sure he is at 100% health for the regular uh, season in, in week one. Saquon Barkley, I have no problem with. What I will say is the first week of practice back, seven to ten days. This is when uh, all the doctors that I follow that are fantasy relevant that uh, talk about fantasy sports say that the re-injury risk is highest within the first week of practice. So if you injure yourself, uh, if you injure your hamstring, you recover, you come back to practice, that first week will tell you whether or not you're probably going to be okay in the long run because that is the highest pro probability of re-injury. So Squam Barkley, look out for reports this week. If he's back at practice and he's running fine and there are no hiccups or anything, perfectly fine. He is still my number five rated, my number five ranked overall player on my draft board this year. Again, if you want to get all my rankings, 
purchase that draft guide. Marlon Mack, he is in a much scarier situation. His hamstring injury was uh, a lot more severe than Barkley's. Immediately when it happened, they said he's going to miss a few weeks, if not more, putting his week one status, status in jeopardy. Um, and they said they don't know yet if he's going to be playing in week one. And that is next week, guys. That is like 10 days away. There's no guarantee that he is ready for the season opener. And if he is, there's no guarantee that he's even going to be the starting running back here. Before he did leave the game, he was the starting running back for the Colts in week one. But again, this is just like Rashad Penny. When you are a running back in a battle, you need to be there for training camp. You cannot be missing weeks of camp. You cannot be missing weeks of rep because this is a new regime and a completely new offense for the Colts. So it's not like they were the ones who handpicked Marlon Mack. It's not like they were the ones who invested draft capital um, and he was a fourth round pick anyway. So the draft capital wasn't very high to begin with. So he is, he is definitely on a short leash, I would assume. So it's a super muddy backfield between Marlon Mack, Chris, Kristen Michael, um, who's had his fair share of work so far as, uh, with the ones. We have the hyped up rookie Jordan Wilkins, who I own in both of my leagues. He is a, I got him in like the second to last round of both my leagues, so I'm not hyping him up to be something that he's not, but he is a great late round flyer because I think a lot of running backs tend to emerge from mur uh, murky backfields. Like, these are the ones that surprise you, right? You think about like um, Alvin Kamara last year, or I would say Kareem Hunt, but Spencer Ware went down with the injury. It probably would have happened over the course of the year. Um, but a lot of breakout running backs that you did not see coming. The reason you don't see coming is because there's so many faces and names there and eventually someone emerges and kind of busts out. And Jordan Wilkins is my favorite one to grab this year because his draft capital is so, um, is so late. And I think he's got a skill set that features three down, uh, three down back skill set. Like the traits are there in order for him to own every back or every down, I should say, sorry. He's currently going as running back 55, 171 overall. And then you have Naeem Hines, who's been absolutely terrible this preseason, but you know he's an, he, he's an athlete. He can still carve out a pass catching role. I was never too concerned about him really taking anyone's reps, but just saying there's a lot of heads there. We have Robert Turbin, who was suspended for the first four games. There's a real chance that he comes back after that first month of the season and has a goal line role because he's a big boy. He's a big back. Um, last year, he played in just six games compared to Marlon Max 14, and he had just one less goal line carry than Mack did. So... Um, you see that they want to use Turbin at that part of the field, and it wouldn't surprise me for him to have that role when he gets back. Uh, Turbin's 225 pounds. He's built like a tank, so there is that. Now, this is going to turn into a committee, most likely, uh, and it'll be nearly impossible to predict over the first half of the season. If we do see someone emerge as a feature back here, it's probably going to happen after week six in the second half of the season. That being said, there's no reason to invest in a guy in Marlon Mack within the top 100 picks, right? What is that, like a seventh round pick? Um, he probably, I, w I don't even know if I would say he has the most upside in this backfield. People like him, of course, because he has the seniority there and he was running with the starters, but him missing this much this much time in a running back by committee gets me very, 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 very nervous, guys. And uh, the probability of re-injuring that again is probably pretty high. We'll see what happens with Mack when he does return to practice. I don't think he has yet. So this is a scary situation that I'm completely staying away from. The last thing is that Andrew Luck, of course, coming back from this shoulder injury, he looked really bad in the second preseason game. He looked better in the... Oh, man. Got this hair all over my new jersey. He looked better in the third preseason game, uh, but we're still yet to see Luck really wind it up and, and really chuck the ball deep, throw that fastball down the field, hit T.Y. Hilton in stride for a 40, 50, 60 yard game. There's always the possibility. Now, while I, I think Luck will be fine, I think he will be back to near his former self, there's always the possibility that he is not. He just doesn't come back as a player that he once was and he's a good short to intermediate passer um, but he's just not the player that he once was if that if that's being said then the whole idea of owning the running back in this Colts this Andrew Luck led offense is just a myth and it's not even a real thing so if Luck is not the player that he once was and he just has an average season uh, there's no reason to own a running back a running back in a running back by committee in an average offense, right? You want this running back. So everybody wants Marlon Mack to work out so bad because he's going to be the running back behind Andrew Luck. However, if Andrew Luck is not Andrew Luck, got news for you, that running back is far, far less valuable. So that's kind of uh, what I would leave you with Marlon Mack. There's just far too many question marks here for me between the injury, between the committee going on here. I'm just probably staying away from this backfield until the later, 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 later rounds of the draft and you can't get Mack in the later rounds of the draft. So that would be why I'm avoiding him.
if y'all haven't peeped the jersey thus far, this is throwback Jamal Anderson. Authentic, beautifully stitched up. I'm ready for the season. I, I linked up with my man, the Jersey Jungle on Instagram. He gets you authentic jerseys starting at $40, 40 USD, 40 United States pesos. What you gotta do if you want an authentic jersey, go check him out first of all, his, his account is dope, at the Jersey Jungle on Instagram. I'm telling you, authentic jerseys starting at $40 a pop. Now normally, when you get these hookups, it's, some, it's from some like Chinese dealer or something and they charge you like $20, $30 shipping. However, my man will hook you up with free shipping if you tell him Big Dog sent you. You tell him your man's Nick at BDGE sent you, he will give you free shipping on your orders. You can get NFL jerseys, MLB jerseys, NBA jerseys, NHL jerseys. Go check out his account on Instagram and he will hook you up with anything that you would like. Customizable jerseys, it don't matter. This is a custom throwback jersey, yo. I'm probably gonna order a few more Falcons jerseys. I need to get me a Steven Adams, Oklahoma City Thunder jersey. What other jerseys do I wanna get? I don't know, but I can get any of them pretty much that, that I want. So I know a bunch of my subscribers have one already ordered the jerseys and you guys keep tagging me in the, in the jerseys that you do order because I wanna see how dope they look. Two, I know I have a lot of people asking me like, is it legit, is it is it? Is it a scam? Like, what's going on here? I can guarantee you, I can vouch for the man. This one just came in, and I could not be happier about this jersey. This thing is on point. There's no website or anything. You just got to DM him on Instagram. It's at the Jersey Jungle. Hit him up, say, I want this jersey. The Nick sent me from Big Dogs. Give me that free shipping, and he will take care of you. These things are legit, and uh, I'm super pumped to get a few more of them. But let's move on to numero four. And this is Mark Ingram, New Orleans Saints running back, current ADP. 57 running back 25. There are a ton of things I do not like about this situation. And I know a lot of you guys probably like Mark Ingram and I've seen him get as, I, I've seen him go as early as round four, usually around round five. That is way too early for me and way too early to think about drafting Mark Ingram here. People think that they're getting a steal with Ingram. People assume that when he comes back from his suspension, of course he's facing this four game suspension to start the year. When he returns, he's going to have the exact same role that he had down the stretch last year. Not down the stretch, the, the, the exact same role we've seen Mark Ingram have over the last few years. This is not a situation like last year with Zeke, where he got suspended, but when he came back, you knew exactly what he was going to be. He was the unquestioned workhorse starter there for Dallas. This is not like this with Mark Ingram. While he is certainly a very good NFL running back, I'm not arguing that he has a lot of red flags here and a lot of things working against him. Number one, number one, guys, he is suspended for four games. He's missing the first four games of your season. That is almost 30% of your regular fantasy season. So that is number one. Do, do not forget that. I know it's Mark Ingram, but he's missing four games. He's literally just gonna be sitting on your bench for four games. And the shitty part about that is if you own Ingram, the early season schedule, the strength of schedule during the first four games while he suspended is juicy. They played the Bucks at home, uh, the Browns at home, the Falcons in Atlanta, and then they traveled to New York to play the Giants. So we have Tampa Bay, Cleveland, Atlanta, New York. They might not be all juicy matchups in terms of um, the, the rush D, the opposing rush D being easy for them, because I know some of those those teams were actually pretty good against the run, but the Saints are going to be heavily, heavily favored at home against Tampa Bay without James Winston, at home against Cleveland, um, and then at the Giants, they're definitely going to be favored. Atlanta's the only one they probably won't be favored in because they're at Atlanta, but Atlanta gives up the single most fantasy points to uh, opposing running backs by way of reception, and that's obviously a big part of Ingram's game. The, the game script is going to be really, 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 really good for the Saints and their, their running backs. Um, and I actually just saw a stat yesterday. I think Pat Thorman of PFF tweeted this out, or it might have been Scott Barrett. I'm not sure if it's Scott Barrett or Pat Thorman, but one of them tweeted out, over the last two years, Mark Ingram has averaged 19 fantasy points per game in games where, I don't remember if it was where games where the Saints were favored or if they ended up winning the game by like seven or more points. It was something where like when they're leading or when they're expected to be winners or something, Mark Ingram averaged 19 fantasy points per game. And on the vice versa side of it, it was only nine fantasy points per game. So he's missing out on a big chunk of games in which he would have produced. Um, and this means that Jonathan Williams, who is the backup there and supposed to take over the Ingram role is uh, in line to have at least a decent workload. We talk about him missing four games. That is point number one. Point number two is that the strength of schedule while he misses it 
is very juicy. He comes back in week five, and then he takes on a tough Washington run defense. Washington, people might not know this, they rank top five in both yards per, ga yards per carry against opposing running backs last year and in Football Outsiders DVOA. For those of you guys who don't know what Football Outsiders or DVOA is, uh, Football Outsiders is a really awesome, useful, free resource. I would, I would check them out if I were you, footballoutsiders.com. DVOA is basically their efficiency metric. Anytime you hear DVOA, you just think of efficiency, how good a team is, right? And this is not just like a yards per carry because those are very uh, those are very based on like a lot of interchangeable variables that it's not a real good metric on how efficient a team is but dvoa tends to make things a little clearer in terms of efficiency so washington was a very good run defense that will be the first game that ingram comes back to then he goes on the road at baltimore at minnesota la rams a team whose middle will be occupied by aaron donald and dominican sue Dominican Suh, dude. There are no tough match. There are no easy matchups for Ingram when he returns. Washington at Baltimore at Minnesota, LA Rams. Those are really, really tough games for a running back to succeed in. The problems don't stop there, though. By no means do I think that Ingram's role is cemented into this offense what it was last year. Not that I don't think he's not going to get work. I think he is going to come back, and I'm sure he will get work in this offense. But we have no idea what his role is going to be. It's not defined at all. Um, there's clearly a rift between Ingram and the coaches in this in this Saints office, right? There's something going on there, right? He didn't want to report for camp, and I don't know. There were reports coming out about the Saints putting him in the doghouse, and there I don't know. There was so usually where there's smoke, there's fire here. So we're talking about a rift between these two between the two sides here, Ingram and the coaches, right? Um, there's no telling if he comes back and they just want to teach him a lesson. He's suspended for the first four games and then they give him, I don't know, six touches for the next few games. And that's basically, that basically makes him useless for half of your fantasy season. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if he flirted with eight to ten touches when he got back. Um, because the coaches might just not want to play him, right? They might just want to teach him a lesson. That's really it. Um, and the other part, as I was saying about the easy early season strength of schedule for the running backs is... What happens if Alvin Kamara balls the fuck out? What happens if Alvin Kamara gets fed 25 touches a game and he absolutely goes bonkers, right? Does the coaching staff say to themselves, ah, you know what? Now that Ingram's back, we have to put him back into the lineup. If Alvin Kamara has handled the load and he's, he's shown that he can handle a huge uh, volume workload, why would the Saints have any motivation to take him off the field if he is balling out which i expect him to do considering the teams that they're playing should set him up for very 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 good numbers why would they just insert ingram ingram back into the lineup for no reason whatsoever they have one of the top offensive lines the game scripts should be great so kamara should ball out and we saw in their second dress rehearsal also kamara played the entire first series with the starters and rather than leaning on their bigger back, rather than even giving it to jo uh, Jonathan Williams or giving it to Mark Ingram, who did play in this game as well, they gave it to Kamara on the goal line. They gave it to him on the two-yard line and let him score. So is Ingram even going to be the goal line back when he is uh, back and when he returns from the suspension? We don't know. Uh, I think that down the stretch last year, we saw what the Saints game plan was going to be and we saw which way that they were shifting, right? And it was echoed in rumors all offseason that their plan was to move more towards Kamara as their featured back in 2018. NFL.com's Ian Rappaport reports, the Saints were planning to make Alan Kamara their featured back even before Mark Ingram's four-game suspension. Over the last five games of 2017, including their two playoff games, Kamara outtouched Ingram 78-71. Uh, Graham Barfield, one of my favorite fantasy analysts, I would highly recommend you follow him on Twitter, at Graham Barfield, also noted that Kamara outsnapped Ingram over their final eight games. And in the most important games, the two playoff games, Kamara saw 21 carries to Ingram's 19 and 10 targets to Ingram's two targets. Outgained him 138 to 63, scored twice to Ingram's zero. You're seeing just how one efficient Kamara was, of course, but how the Saints uh, we're starting to realize what they have in Kamara, and and it's not something that they want to shy away from. Clearly, from the offseason reports, they wanted to use Kamara as their feature back in 2018. The other concerns I have here, which are definitely more of reach concerns, but I figure they're kind of noticeable. Um, they're less likely to happen and less really likely to impact Ingram's role here. Uh, but I figured I'd bring them up because you know they pop into my head. So obviously, 
they might be in, it might be real things, who knows, but here's what they are. As I brought up Jonathan Williams, saw it a couple years ago, right, with Tim Hightower, started playing well, started playing really well, and they just kept feeding him more and more. And he completely split that backfield in half between him and Ingram in terms of touches. So what happens if Jonathan Williams starts playing really, really well? We've seen that the Saints coaching staff has no problem giving the work to whoever's playing well and feeding the hot hand. That doesn't automatically mean that Ingram is going to be back into his position uh, in that Jonathan Williams role. So that that is my concern there. It's obviously more of a reach because I'm sure they know what they have in Ingram and he is a good NFL running back. So it would be kind of naive to think that Jonathan Williams at this point is better than, than Mark Ingram. But, you know, it's just still another thing to consider. The last thing, of course, and this is also a reach, is he suspended because he did PEDs. The guy's taking the juice. Of course, it wasn't his fault, right? The doctor prescribed him something that he thought was legal, as is the case for everyone. But what if he is, what if he's been doing that for the last couple of years, right? Ingram didn't start off, he had a pretty bad career to start off in the NFL, right? He was not efficient. He, he didn't look like a good running back. Then all of a sudden he took off and he's been an absolute animal for the last couple of years. Does the PED use have anything to do with that? And now that he's off the juice, now that he is no longer taking these PEDs, do we see a step back from Ingram? Is he not the same player? Is he not as explosive? Is he not as powerful? Is he not as, um, you know, does he not have as much burst? And this is something I thought about, but like at the same time, uh, you know, he's still going to have his vision and he's still going to be able to catch the ball and all this stuff. But that is something to consider as well. And these last two points, like I said, were kind of, kind of a, a reach, but they are things to consider as well. So I just, I just think at the end of the day, the Saints are going to play really, 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 really well to start the season. Kamara is going to eat. Jonathan Williams is going to get his touches. And I don't think there, I don't think the offense, the Saints offense, is going to give the uh, the coaching staff a reason to insert Ingram back into a 15 or more touch role, 13 to 15 touches. I could see him getting somewhere from like 8 to 10 for the rest of the way. And do you really want to use your fifth or sixth round pick on that? I think he's pretty much like Tevin Coleman. Um, I think the Saints backfield is similar to the Falcons backfield in a way. Um, so I think you're getting Tevin Coleman basically in Mark Ingram. Uh, but you have to draft him around earlier, and he is suspended for the first four games of the season. So that is why I don't like Ingram. We've had my top four running backs to avoid. We've had Ronald Jones. We've had Rashad Penny. We've had Marlon Mack. We've had Mark Ingram. And I want to name some uh, honorable mentions here. There are a few guys that I also have on this list that I, I hope at this point you are staying away from. But before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video, fantasyjocks.com. FantasyJocks.com is the number one leader in all your fantasy league's needs. I'm talking about championship belts. I'm talking about championship ringalings, championship trophies. We have draft boards. Guys, if your draft is this weekend, you could still get on FantasyJocks.com, order a draft board, and get expedited shipping. So it'll be there in time. They have awesome draft boards. I've been using them for all of my drafts over the last three, four, maybe in five years right now. We use a championship belt for my league. It is awesome because once you win that thing, you strut that around everywhere you go pretty much. But they have the rings. They have the trophies if your budget is a little lower than it is for a belt. But you can get these bad boys customized as you could do uh, on the Lombardi trophy. You can get the team names engraved uh, onto the side of them so you know who won the chip each year. It's there. It is written in stone. And uh, yeah, guys, this is... Uh, I'm telling you, bro, they have the... Best, 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 best equipment for your fantasy league. Uh, I would not sell this to you if I did not believe in the product, and I promise you I do. I've been using their stuff for about five years now. So fantasyjocks.com is the spot to go. If you need anything for your league, have everyone chip in seven, eight, ten bucks and get yourself a trophy, get yourself a belt, get whatever you want, and use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, for 10% off your purchase. Hopefully that'll help you out and incentivize you to make that purchase. Um, link will be down below for fantasyjocks.com. And thank you for sponsoring today's video, guys. Love y'all. Honorable mentions. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. There's only three guys that I want you to stay away from, only because then uh, if you're watching this, you might be not newer to the fantasy game, but you might just be starting the research and you've heard these names out loud. So maybe you're like, oh, I should take a late round flyer. First is CJ Anderson getting picked as RB41, 113th overall. He is clearly, clearly, clearly running far behind Christian McCaffrey. McCaffrey is going to be used as the absolute workhorse here in the Panther backfield. Um, CJ Anderson at this point is even splitting time with Cameron Artis Payne. Uh, he's playing into the third and fourth quarter of preseason games. So 
this is someone you want to absolutely stay away from. Next is Doug Martin being picked at RB53. And again, this is for newer fantasy guys who might just hear the name and get excited about it because he's had good seasons before. Um, but Doug Martin is absolutely not the back to own in the Oakland backfield. We have Marshawn Lynch there, who has been, uh, who was a beast down the second half of last season. So down the stretch, he was very, 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 he went into beast mode, y'all, and they need to be giving him more touches. I hope they do so. We don't know. But Marshawn Lynch is the guy to own back there. We've seen um, Chris Warren rookie this year ball out in the preseason so maybe someone from behind the depth chart actually surprises us and and gets ahead of Doug Martin but stay away from Martin tell me uh, I'm, I'm telling you it's a waste of a pick if you do it then you have Deonta Foreman running back 57 towards Achilles last year guys uh, there is a very very good chance he ends up on the pup list and will miss the first six games of the season I had Dr. Jesse Morris on my channel a few weeks ago and he talked about how when you tear an Achilles, any running back who's torn an Achilles basically comes back with 70 to 80% less explosiveness and burst. Guys, Foreman, I don't want to say his career is shot, but it's pretty, uh, It's it, it's got a dim outlook to it, guys. So Foreman is a guy I'm staying away from. You might think he has upside, but first of all, he's going to miss a, a big portion. If he doesn't get put on the pup list, he's still definitely going to miss like three, four weeks of the season. There's no timetable for his return, so I would stay as far away from Foreman as possible. I think Anderson, Martin, Foreman are all pretty much wasted picks at this point in your draft if you go with them, so don't pick those guys, guys. And uh, that's going to wrap up the episode for today. So if you enjoyed the uh, episode, a thumbs up down below would be awesome. I really appreciate it because I put a lot of work into these videos. If you're listening via podcast, a rating and review would be awesome as well. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you want an authentic jersey, make sure you hit up at the Jersey Jungle on Instagram. Just slide into the DMs. He will hook you up. Tell him Big Dog sent you. And make sure you drop or you cop. Don't drop. Don't drop the draft guy. You got to cop the draft guy, baby. BigDogsFantasy.com. Everything will be linked below. I love you guys if you stayed thus far into the video. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Peace.